Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Creative Space, a podcast where we explore, learn, and grow in creativity together. I'm your host, Jennifer Logue, and today we have the pleasure of chatting with Steve Adabo. He's a music producer, songwriter, audio engineer, and Grammy winner, so cool, who's helped launch the careers of Suzanne Vega and Sean Colvin. He's owned Shelter Island Sound in New York City for over 30 years, and he's produced and engineered artists like Bob Dylan, Bobby McFerrin, Jeff Buckley, Olivia Newton-John, and many, many more. He's also a friend of mine and a wonderful human. Welcome to, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Creative Space, Steve. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. This is fun. It's such an honor. Oh, my gosh. And I see you're in the studio. So Yeah, I figured and- we'd do a studio shoot here. Why not? Love it. Um, so we're going to jump right into it. Actually, I wanted to, how did we meet again? <laughs> we talked we, about this a little we, bit. but We were trying to figure this out. I, you seem, to, I mean, you have a better memory than me. You seem to think we were at a, uh, one of these NARIP uh, music supervisor meetings that I held at the studio here that uh, Tess Taylor runs out from California, where we <clears throat> they bring in music supervisors and people pitch their music. So I gotten involved with her and maybe maybe that's where you maybe you came to one of those. I can't imagine where else we met. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Um, yeah. But then we ended up collaborating on a few songs, which was so cool. And yeah, they're still going to come out somewhere. They will land somewhere. They're good. <laughs> Oh, that's, well, that, if you think that, Steve, that makes me feel, feel really good. So yeah, I do. I, I think we wrote some good pop songs there. Cool. Putting it out into the universe. Yeah. Um, so we never really got a chance to talk about your early life and your upbringing. Um, your career has, you've done so many cool things in your career, Steve. So there's so much to dig into. Um, but when did you first discover your love for music? You know, I, it could go back as early as second grade, I think. Um, even, maybe even earlier than that, you know, when I was four or five, I remember <clears throat> my parents had a small record player, you know, and I think they had a version of Perry Como's Hot Diggity Dog Diggity. It was a single. And I still remember playing that when I'm like four or five years old. So that was kind of my first inkling that I, you know, I appreciated music or pop songs. I mean, it's it's a terrible record if you listen to it now, <laughs> but, you know, for a four or five year old, it seemed pretty magical. And then um, I guess I remember like in second grade, I just kind of remember my mom was, was kind of a, she wasn't a musician, but she would you know, sit down. We didn't have a piano in the house, but my grandmother had one and she used to sit down at the piano and dabble and she would sing to herself. Um, so I think that somewhere that, you know, she had some kind of musical gene. She never took advantage of it that much. And then I just started singing to myself. And I think it was a very strange story that I was on the school bus coming home. I think it's second grade. And the bus driver says, you come up here. Huh. So I go, oh. He goes, sing and uh, sing that song, Fascination, for me. Now, how does he know I know how to sing? How does he know I even know this song? I still have, I've never figured this one out, you know. Wow. And, and so somehow I remember singing the song, It Was Fascination, I Know, da 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 you know. And maybe I learned it from my mother. How did I know this song? And how did he know I could sing? And I'm singing on a school bus to this bus driver and that was that's all i remember of this of the the whole thing it was like weird and then wow. you know yeah and then later on um you know i got introduced to the guitar and uh when i was about i guess mm, fourth or fifth grade i uh, started dabbling playing a little bit with it and then i had a next door neighbor who was very influential it turns out because he was a he was an electronic engineer, worked in avionics for Grumman, I think, and he was in wedding bands on the weekend. And he had this great guitar set up in an Echoplex, and and he just set up all his stuff. And I go over there and listen to like this beautiful old guitar stuff, you know. Wow. So that was pretty much. I'm going to learn how to do this, you know. That that's what I want to do. 
How old were you when you first started going over his house? Oh, I would say, I mean, he was right next door. So I, you know, I would say I was in fourth or fifth grade, however old that is, 10 or 11, something like that, you know. And, uh, and, you know, just kind of hearing, you know, a guitar sounding that good, that close up was like, yeah, you know, and it was, and I mean, he played very kind of standard kind of stuff, wasn't rock and roll, but it was still, you know, very impressive sounding to me. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to learn how to do this. Nice. And you started playing the guitar then, like around yeah. fourth grade? Yeah. And then my mom finally figured out that, you know, I could, t- I should take guitar lessons. And so we rented a nylon string guitar from the, the school and I'd go there on Saturday mornings and just start taking lessons. And, and that was, that was, you know, that was kind of the beginning. Awesome. Yeah. Um, when did you know you wanted to do music professionally? Oh, well, I think pretty much once I got, once I got into college, you know, and I was, you know, I was also on both sides of the fence. I really liked the technical world. I liked to fiddle with electronics, but I really like playing guitar and, and, and doing music. So, um, you know, once I started getting into serious engineering school, I was like, I don't know if I really want to do this for my whole living, you know? So I just kept playing guitar and then I started, then I also became a music major at the same time, which helped me, uh, <clears throat> in those days you needed to have a, a college deferment to stay out of the draft. This was the Vietnam war era. Oh. And, um, if you didn't, and you got a, a low number in the in the draft lottery. I don't even know if you know what that is, but there was a time. I guess it was, I think in nineteen seventy or seventy one. They did a draft lottery where basically, they played bingo with your life. There was three hundred and sixty five balls with birth dates on them, you know, and they picked them out. And the first one hundred and twenty birthdays, you were going to get drafted. The next oh. ones, maybe not. And if you got lucky and you got like over 240, chances are you wouldn't get drafted. So that was the first time I was in the top 10. So I got my my birthday came out almost immediately. And uh, I was like, damn. So, But luckily I was, uh, I had my 2S deferment, which kept you out. Which kept you out. Cool. And because I was a double degree guy doing music and engineering, I had an extra year, and that extra year proved to be crucial because the draft ended in the spring of my final year of school. I'd already gotten a letter to come down to Whitehall Street and get my physical. Wow. So music saved your life. Uh, I would say. You know, I would say having that that music degree definitely. I mean, I don't know what I would have done if I actually was faced with being drafted. I mean, there was ways to get around it or you know, claiming you have psychiatric problems and building up. I mean, we there were ways people were running running off to Canada. I don't know if I'd ever been that brave to do that, but I don't think I was, uh, I just couldn't imagine being in the Army. It just wasn't, so luckily I didn't have to deal with it. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> we're all very lucky <laughs> because Whoa. you have a lot of music to make. Yeah. Um, so now on to... Um, you know, thoughts on creativity and the creative life. This is creative space. So I ask this question of everyone. Mm-hmm. How would you define creativity? Mm. And where does it come from? Wow. Well, I, defining creativity, not an easy question to answer. Obviously, you know that. But um, to me, when I feel like I'm creative, and I don't even know if this answers the question, is when you get into a zone where you start to forget about the material world around you and what you're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And you get into this world where something emerges, you know, whether it's from your unconscious or your conscious or you start it. And for me, it was, it was writing music. I mean, I started writing, I wrote my first song. I, I don't think I was, I don't even know if I was playing, I might, I don't even know if I was playing guitar at that point. So I might've been like 10 or 11 years old. My uncle had given me this little portable battery powered tape recorder with the little three inch, three inch reels, three and a half inch reels on it. And I would do my own radio show, counting down the top 10 and stuff. And then one day, I, you know, I started, I just wrote my own song. It was kind of a takeoff on a Beach Boys song about a fast car or something. It was terrible, but it was, <laughs> you know, it was, I, I just started to write a song for no reason. So, um, you know, I think I think a lot of people have very different ways of 
getting to their creative core. Some people are very disciplined about it. Other people just wait for the muse to hit them. Um, but I think I think when it's the best is when all of a sudden you just, and a lot of times for me, if I first sit down at the guitar, and I'm not even thinking, I just start playing something, like there'll be a pretty cool lick. That maybe I could do something with this. You know, then, then you start to think about it. And then, uh, you know, either the door opens or the door slams in your face and you go, mm-hmm. this is going nowhere. Um, but where that where that um, drive comes from to do that or just even that ability to sit down and go, okay, I'm going to put this together now. You know, I really need a better second line or, you know, you write a great first line and that's like, great, now I have to write the rest of the song. What is this about? You know, I don't know. I don't really know. So, um, you know, but the, where that creative juices spring from you know for me also it's you just just sitting down and playing the guitar it puts you in a zone that disconnects you from a lot of the material world and you just kind of get in there and all of a sudden it's like if you've done your homework practicing the guitar over the years and and you can just kind of not think about where your fingers are going and just kind of start to just play I mean, that comes from a place that's very much like improvising. It just comes from a place where you're not really thinking, but your body and emotions are, are, are leading the way. And um, it starts to, it, you start to get into the spot where the stuff comes out. And you don't even know where it's coming from. You go, did I just do that? I, and I don't even know where that is, you know. And, and what did I do 10 minutes ago? I don't really remember now, you know, so... So it, it's flow. elusive that, you know, it, it's elusive to get into that zone. And, um, you know, there are times when you feel like you're more receptive to it. And then there are times when you just feel like you're knocking your head against the wall. And, and I mean, other people, I mean, I, I know people like, especially the writers in Nashville, you know, they have their, their regimen and they go and have these three hour co-writing sessions with people and they really f- kind of push themselves to, to get into that zone. And I think that's a lot of the success of a lot of people that they actually, you know, they just basically say they show up, you know, if you show up and you start to do it, something maybe will happen. If you don't show up or you think about doing it, then you get nothing, you know, you got to take action. I think so. I think that's, yeah. a, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of art is in a certain sense, um, that was the right word. I don't want to say mechanical, but just it, it's the it's the the people who have have the ability to sit down and do it. And a lot of us don't. A lot of us are just too busy doing so much other stuff. You know, I'm actually working on my new song called "Busy Doing Nothing," which kind of <laughs> kind of speaks to this. You know, and it, it's I've just got to get it. it's basically done, but I got to I got to finish it. But it. it um, it's like, my God, I got no time for this. I've got no time for that. I mean, I'm busy doing nothing. What am I doing? You know, but in, in the day is like, my God, I don't have time for this. And it's like the true artist th- puts all that stuff aside and then starts to, and just gets down to it, you know, and you know, having been around some really true artists like Suzanne Vega or Eric Anderson, or they just this is central to their core, you know, where I'm kind of like, well, I'm an engineer, I'm a producer, I'm a guitar player, I write songs sometimes, I've got all these other things going on. So it's very hard for me to just fashion myself as a songwriter and get into that creative zone. And there are different types of creative zones. There's the ones where you're trying to write. There's also the ones where you're trying to work on, help someone else when I'm producing somebody mm. to, to, um, you know, help them realize what they're trying to get to. And certainly being creative in a way of, of working with someone who's trying to do a vocal, which is one of the hardest things of that we all do, you know, in a studio trying to get, um, get to a spot where it's exciting and honest and the singer's really connecting with the song and, and then therefore connecting with me through the speakers, which is my job and in, in, as being a producer to, to make that happen. So there's that creative zone, which I love being in also, because all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in a tunnel together and you're trying to get to the other end. And mm. it's very much like being in a tunnel, a creative zone, I think, because you're just kind of in there and you're, you're working with, you know, what you have and, and trying to keep 
you know, keeping the voices and say, this sucks. You suck. What are you doing this for? Go away. You know, go do something else. <laughs> and, uh, you know, once you can beat away those demons and stuff and, and uh, just let it flow, then it, it, it kind of, it, it does parallel in a lot of different ways, you know, making a record, writing a song, doing a mix, you know, it's like all these, all these um, steps to making a record, to making music, uh, all involve a little different level or area of creativity. And um, it's still a fascinating thing for me to do it because when you really get there and then you can actually sit back and listen to what you did and like it, that's a good spot to be in. Oh. It doesn't always happen. You know, it's hard to get to that spot. It, you know, it doesn't. And, um, you know, that kind of lands on another question that I had. How do you know when a work is complete? <laughs> like, how do you know for you when a song is done or when a mix is done? Or because you could perpetually keep going with it. Well, yeah, especially today with all we have at our fingertips, you know, we can you can get into such nitty gritty, minute details that no one will ever notice. Um <clears throat> I think there's just a point where it's it's satisfying and and you feel like you've 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 uh, put in I almost the right way to say this you, you feel like you have examined especially like in a mix let's say let's start there it, it it's it's so it's so variable and it, it has so many solutions you know there's so many possibilities that it's very hard to keep you know, keep, keep your eye on the ball and just, and just, just really create and create a mix that really works. And what does that mean? That means a, a mix that, that comes out of the speakers, sounds good, makes people want to listen to the song, makes people want to listen to the singer, makes people want to listen to the, the storyline. Um, and, and all the technical mumbo jumbo that we do to get there is, is behind the scenes and you don't see it. So how do you know when it's done is when that all that kind of goes away and you're listening and all of a sudden you go, oh, that sounds like a song now and you're done. I mean, that's usually what that, the, the point I get was, you know what, that sounds that sounds like a song now. It's OK. You know, yeah, maybe the guitar part could be a half a dB lower in that verse, you know, but maybe not. Maybe it's actually good that way because it's not really going to matter that much to an, the other outside listener if the guitar is a half a dB louder or not in that verse because as long as it's not distracting from the vocal line, um, it's uh, it's it's hard to know when you're really done. But at a certain point, it's like, well, I've, I've pretty much done everything I can. It sounds good to me. I can sit back and listen to it and not go, oh, crap, that's in the way. Or, no, I really can't hear that third line of that verse. I got to go back in and get that up a little bit. Or the bass is really too loud. Or, oh, my God, it's just endless, you know. Um, so you could mix forever, but I think there is a certain point when you go, okay, this is done. And also, the same thing with writing a song. I think at a certain point, you know, you start with the first line of the, of the first verse and then maybe the rest of the verse comes and then maybe you figure out an idea for the second verse and yeah, have a chorus idea or you have the chorus idea first. And But then as, as you just play it through, you go, yeah, this is done. And of course, the best way to figure out if your song is done is to go play it in front of an audience mm. and see if they take their cell phones out in the second verse or they're listening to you, you know, because... And I tell that a lot of my artists, you know, a lot of people want to come in here. I just just wrote this song. I want to record it. And I go, did you play it for anybody? Did you play it out there? No. Let's go play it out there and then, then come back in and do it. And you'd be amazed. Just you know right away, you know, if you're singing, doing a song live in an audience and something's not right, that second verse is lagging or it's not interesting. or um, So, I mean, I think that's when your song is done, when you actually play it in front of, play in front of an audience and, the, and they, they follow you all the way through. And you feel really good at the end of it. That's a great uh, way to go about just when you decide to record something. Like, yeah. have you played it? Some of my best songs have been ones that I've, you know, written in bands. And we got to see the audience's reaction. You get to get a feel for it. And I mean, I find myself rewriting this song a lot as it's being performed. Rewriting it as you perform it? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that. I think that's part of the process. I think it's really a really important part of the process because once once you, I mean, I always like to have extra ears around either when I'm mixing or um, you know, or that 
when, you, when you're playing the song for an audience, or even if it's six people, it doesn't really matter. But you know, right? You, you kind of know that, yeah, this is a complete work, and um, and it's working. You know, I see people responding to it. I see them following the the storyline. I, you know, I, I I feel the connection, and then I go, yeah, this is this works. This is a good song. You know, it it, it uh, so then yeah, then then you're finished writing it. You know, cool. Um, so when you create something, I love this story about your song with your band Arbuckle. <laughs> it, it's, you never know when something's going to land. No, you know, and so true. once you create something, it takes on a life of its own. You have no control over how people perceive it, where it goes, but you did your job and you stepped up to the plate. You, you know, brought it to fruition and now it's in the world for people to enjoy. <laughs> and sometimes how many years ago <laughs> I, we have to hear this story i love this story so much about your song all right well when i was in college you know i was um yeah i was i was at stony brook university my my next door neighbor in the dorm my buddy ron fierstein uh had a rock band <clears throat> in brooklyn he'd go back every weekend but him and i were both kind of folkies at heart. He liked Cat Stevens. I liked James Taylor. And so we, we kind of teamed up and did an acoustic duo and we were writing songs. He would write his, we weren't necessarily writing together, but he had his songs. I had my songs. And we, we played around the coffee houses and on at Stony Brook and a couple off, off campus. We opened up for Josh White Jr. once. That was like our big gig. And eventually we melded our folk songs, our acoustic songs with his rock band and formed a band. And one of the members of the band had some connections. He worked, uh, he was an intern at Billboard or something, and he found these producers who were looking for a young band. And this, they came down to see us. We had a, they had a rehearsal space in Brooklyn. I was commuting from Stony Brook to Brooklyn to rehearse in between classes. And uh, they liked us, and we got a, we got a record deal. And I was uh, barely a senior in high and I was actually had a year another year to go in school because I it was a five-year person now so um so my last my last year I was on the road doing gigs plus going to the studio and I got to work at Media Sound Studio oh, cool. B which is a legendary place in New York City to to record our first record and um came out on a la label called Musicor Records and originally the name of the band was Circus, but for some reason we didn't think that was cool. Since my friend Ron was kind of heavy set that time, because that was his way of staying out of the draft to be overweight, which was he was successful with. Um, <clears throat> it was an unbelievable way to go through to stay out of Vietnam, you know. And um, um, somehow his friends used to nicknamed them Fatty Arbuckle. So this name Arbuckle was kind of floating around. Uh -huh. Little did we know that Fatty Arbuckle was a complete pervert, child molester. What We didn't know that. Oh, no. Just, there was no there was no internet to internet. find this stuff out, you know. <laughs> he couldn't yeah, do Arbuckle, a check. That's, a, that's an unusual name. No one's, there's no band's name. So we renamed the band Arbuckle, and it's such a terrible name. But anyway, um, and that was the record that came out on Music Core Records in late 72, I guess it came out. And um, we, you know, we got some local radio play and we got to open up for Bruce Springsteen at the Roxy Theater in Philadelphia. After wow. His, after his first record, he drew 200 people there. It's a 600 seat theater. And, and it was really a great, it was one of my great nights because he was up in the dressing room and he saw me take out my guitar. He hands me a wire. We're jamming up in his rest dressing room. And he wow. he sat down and watched our whole set, you know. And then he comes up, hey, my guitar playing, fills out the band nice. It's good. And then he then I sit down and watch his show and it blows us out of the water. We were in kindergarten <laughs> and he was like, he was in a PhD. I mean, it was just... I mean, I, I, just, I don't think I'd ever seen a band that great. You know, the original E Street Band with David wow. Sanchez on keyboards. And I was just like, damn. And the song and it, the way he was, it was just, I mean, it was real. I mean, I was embarrassed that he actually saw my art show. Oh, my gosh. I think we're all harder on ourselves. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, man. You know, but I mean, he was, yeah. It was, but you it was opened for Bruce Springsteen. That's, oh, my God, that's so cool, Steve. Differently, yeah. I mean, he was, but he was just after his first record and he's just, 
you know, and he was talking to me, and he was, eh, record company's not happy. I only sold 30,000 records. I don't know. Eh. And then, of course, you know, two years later, I'm in Brooklyn uh, driving a taxi cab in between gigs to pay the rent. He's on the cover of Time magazine, you know. It's like, holy moly, you know. It's like, this can really happen, you know. So it was wow. it was quite the, quite the uh, eye-opening thing. So anyway, one of the songs I'd written, Ron wrote, wrote more of the songs than I, I only had like two songs that I wrote on the record. And this one song called A New Day, I remember hearing it in my living, at, there was a station on Long Island called WLIR, very influential FM rock progressive station at the time. And I was sitting there, and my mom was there, and all of a sudden my song came on the radio. And it was like such a, you know, one of those moments, like, oh my gosh, you know. Wow. It was like, wow, it's really on the radio. And the guy said he liked it, blah, blah, blah. There, there was no, no real hit from the album. We, you know, we toured a little bit, but, uh, you know, mostly, mostly the, we, I think we did cut a second record, but it never really came out. I don't think we had enough material. And uh, that was kind of the end of it, you know. And I basically forgot about Arbuckle for the next 45 years or whatever it was, you know. Because it was like, okay, you know, it was fun. We did it. Yeah, we opened for Bruce Springsteen. That's a cool story. And uh, we opened for Dr. Hook and the Mendelssohn Show once. That was fun. But, um, but you know, then I just went off to be a road musician. We had a little country trio for a while and I played in a show band for a few years. And cool. I was um, making my living playing guitar though. It's fun. But then 45 years later, <laughs> you get word that art, this song, A New Day is being featured in a Shirley MacLaine film, yeah. The Last Word, uh, which is really cool. It's totally out of the blue. I had nothing to do with it, I guess, because at the time, you know, we knew nothing about the business, so we signed away all our publishing. Not the writer's share, but the, our publisher's share. And at some point, uh, I guess it was the guys who produced us, I guess they, they took the other part of the publishing, and, and at one point, I would, they sold it to another company, but someone was actually working their catalog, and they were looking for authentic 70s music. They didn't want sound alike. They wanted something that was recorded in the 70s. And somehow, some way... They picked that song. It's the only song I sang on the record, too, by the way. Wow, that's cool. Ron, Ron was the, basically the lead singer. And I get this call, you know, going, are you Steve Adabo from Arbuckle? And I'm like, well, I could be. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what this was about. And this lawyer uh, in L.A. was like, well, you know, we've placed your song in this movie and blah, 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 and we just want, you know, do the sign off on it, and there's a there's a sync fee, and da da da. And I said, oh, fine, you know. So I mean, I basically made more money in that sync fee than the entire two years of being an Arbuckle, you know. Oh my the, gosh! The, the band was making fifty dollars a gig, maybe if we were lucky, you know. So it was it was, uh, and and then I got to see the movie, and they use it in this scene where she's going down to see her daughter, and they're driving along the Pacific Coast or something, and it's literally on for like two minutes in the background. Wow. You know, and they, they, my guitar solo was in there and I just have to laugh at it. You know, it's like, it's so, it's such a pristine little guitar solo, you know, I'm so, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. And like, you know, once so in cool. a while it shows up on my ass cap, you know, the statements, they, they played it for a week in Germany and it's, it's like, yeah, back, back then you didn't know 45 years ago no. that the song would resurface in such a big way. Yeah. It's so cool, Steve. And it's such a 70s lyric. I had a rap with a wonderful friend. Like, you know, there wasn't rap music back then. Rap meant you were having a conversation, you know, and I, I listened to that and go, oh boy, it's so 70s, that lyric. <laughs> well, you can't get more 70s than that song. So <laughs> No, you no, no, you know, but uh, yeah, but uh yeah, I mean, the movie's not that bad. I, I You know, I have, you know, an, an, I think, I don't know where, where Shirley MacLaine is these days, but um, I'm, I'm happy. You know, it's actually kind of a cute movie. She wants to, she wants to find someone and write her obit obituary. And then the writer she hires can't find anyone that say a good word about her. So it's, 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 a, it's a cute idea. It's not That's... a fabulous, fabulous movie, but it's not bad, you know. I love the concept. I, I thought it was... <laughs> really well done um the writer in me yeah. uh lo loves it um <laughs> so in my research for this episode i 
found out some things about you that I didn't know about that I Uh-oh. think are really I hope cool. I know about. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Um, so I know you co-produced Tom's Diner for Suzanne Vega. Yep. But I didn't realize it was that song that made her the mother of the MP3. Yeah. And you did the recording. Can we talk about that? That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't know about this either for till, till quite a while later. And this story emerged about Dr. Brandenburg. Um, <clears throat> well, when we were recording Solitude Standing, which is the album that Tom's Diner is on, Tom's Diner opens the album and it's an acapella song because that's the way she did it on in her show. And mm-hmm. it was like, let's just do it that way. Let's not produce it. Let's just let her do a couple, you know. So basically we were up in this, uh, Bearsville Studios up in Woodstock. Excuse me. Which it's a beautiful old studio, no longer there. It's huge. It's like a big, huge barn is the recording room. And everyone from the band and Dylan, I mean, everyone went through that place. So here I am trying, oh, my mic is falling down. So here I am trying to record Suzanne Vega singing an acapella song in this cavern, you know, so I kind of, we have to go bow it all up and, and, and make sure it's not uh, too echoey. And, you know, we were still in the world of tape back then. Obviously, we were using Studer 24-track machine. And it was like, and I was, I was into like having really great sound for her and, and my production. So I decided I would record it on a brand new Sony Digital F1, which is basically a Betamax tape machine hooked up to this little processor. And um, it was really the early, one of the earliest digital recordings, uh, digital recording technology that was around. It was only for two tracks, but I only needed one track for her. Mm. So, you know, we did about seven takes. I think we picked the third take. And the master for that is actually a Betamax tape. You know, it's actually a... Uh, that's how that's how the digital information was stored. They used videotape, and they they did that for for many years. Even when all the CD craze came around, they were using three quarter inch videotape. So that was the master, and uh, we mixed it out in A uh, and M Studios with Shelly Yakis, and um, that was pretty much it, you know. And and okay. we started the song with and started the album with an acapella song, and then we. Um, pretty much went right into Luca after that. It was like a slam dunk, you know, slam dunk kind of beginning of an album to get there, get your attention with an acapella song and then have those, the, the production of Luca come in. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I had no idea. So the story goes that, uh, Dr. Brandenburg was, was tweaking his algorithm for this MP3 because they were trying to figure out a way to make digital files smaller so they could be sent over phone lines and, you know, eventually through the air streaming without too much data. So they were trying to figure out a way to eliminate almost 90% of the data and still make it sound good. Mm. So he thought he had a pretty good thing going. And then he heard the acapella version of Suzanne. He goes, you know, I should probably test it on that because, you know, it's pretty bare. And so when he did it, it sounded terrible. Oh. The vocal was just like digitized, nasty stuff going on in there. And so it's like he says in his little interview, he goes, it caused me a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. So so they had to get so he went back in. They had to figure out a way to, to get rid of the digital distortion on that. And he said he probably listened to that song four or five thousand times. Wow. Is that crazy? So um, and then but eventually, you know, I mean, we all take the MP3 for granted. And mm. considering they're throwing away 90 percent of the, the files, you know, the bits to make it sound, it's, it's pretty miraculous that it sounds as good as it does, you know. Yeah, but I mean, um, that song is like what's at the standard for every MP3 to come after. That like, is so cool. I mean, I cannot tell you, you know, all around the world, as soon as you start singing that melody, everybody knows what it is. Mm. You know, it's so crazy. It's literally the first thing I heard her perform. You know, when I saw her the very first time before we had done any work together, she was opening at Folk City and, uh, we were looking for an artist to develop and, um, you know, she just came out and started, you know, it's pretty bold to start a 
start a you know a set like that and uh, but it was really cool and that's why we started the album that way because we had the song for the first record Sol the solitude standing record was our second album hmm. but for some reason it didn't i didn't want to put it on the first record it didn't seem like it fit and um i'm glad we didn't because it just it, it just exploded i mean luke is what exploded on the second album and then tom's diner the first, you know, one of the early remix remixers, the D, the the duo DNA from England, uh, did it without our permission. They took her vo acapella vocal and put a beat upon it, beat Ooh. on it, and that kind of opened up the freaking door for sampling and uh, so yeah, that's, that that song really <laughs> a landmark in a couple different ways. Yeah, it's such you know, a history making song. Like, who'd have who thought? Who'd have thought a simple, such a simple song, you know, such a simple, but it's such a catchy little melody. Mm -hmm. Melody, remember that, folks? Remember that songwriter's melody? <laughs> right. That's my favorite part of a song, Steve. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so you also co wrote the song Left Up Center with right. Suzanne Vega mm -hmm. or the iconic film Pretty in Pink. I got to ask. First of all, how did that opportunity come about to write well, for the movie? Yeah, well, that's that's the that's the advantage of being on a major label because we Suzanne was on A and M Records, and A and M was a very artist oriented label, and it was run by Herb Alpert, who was a great musician, trumpet player, and Jerry Moss was his business partner. <clears throat> that was the A and M Albert and Moss, and um, so they were very supportive of new artists and. When we got Suzanne signed to them, she became part of the family, and they would do whatever they they could do to to get her famous. You know, just make her successful. That's the word, successful, right? And um, <clears throat> so they were working on this new soundtrack for a new John Hughes film. They had done one with the Breakfast Club, and they were doing a follow up which was going to be pretty in pink. We didn't even know it was called that at the time. And um, they sent us a script. They sent Susanna's script to say, we'd like you to submit a song for this. Maybe we can mm. get you on the soundtrack. Like, ah, sounds good. So we're on the road. And at that, at that point, I was still touring with the band a bit just as a manager overseeing just the day-to-day -day details a lot, you know, being on the road, just kind of being an extra hand there. I... I um, I had started out doing live sound, but then I kind of, we kind of I punted that because it was too much work, and we hired somebody who was probably better at it anyway. So, um, so that was good. Little Robin Danar came in, and um, so you know we're on the road, and she has the script, and we're we're I think we're in San, we're on our way to San Francisco, and I think it's a Monday, and on Thursday. A&M was hoping we'd do a demo for this new song. So I said, oh, Suzanne, how you doing on that new song? She goes, what new song? Oh, no. <laughs> or something like that. I go, have you even looked at the script? She goes, no. Go, oh, okay, look at the script. <laughs> you know, they sent us, <laughs> look at the script. She goes, oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes she had to be pushed a little bit. Yeah. And so she looked at the script, ah, dumb movie, da, da, da. But I go, well, find something, you know. So, so just scribble some stuff down. You know, whatever. So, so she's she's on the bus and she's looking at the, you know, reading some of the script and she's kind of writing some stuff in her notebook. And I goes, well, did you come up with anything? And goes, I don't think so. This is not going to work. And I go, so let me. See. So she shows me. And it's like it's, at one point I see down in the corner she wrote left to center. I said, I like that left to mm -hmm. center. That sounds like a good title. So she goes, okay. So she wrote some lyrics. So then we were in San Francisco on Monday. We're driving down. I think I think we're in L.A. on Tuesday. It was, or was it Wednesday? Maybe Tuesday. We get there, and I go, Suzanne. You know, we have. Have you written anything? She goes, No, not not. I have some words, but I don't have music. I go, okay, I'm coming down. So, I go down there. It's, I remember sitting like in the afternoon, to the, the motel in L.A., <clears throat> and I just sit down and like like I said before, I just kind of start playing the guitar. In that little guitar, the guitar lick, it uh -huh. just came out of nowhere. You know, wow. I was just like, I said, okay, yeah, this is cool. And she goes, yeah, I like that. You know, and she starts singing the words and we put it together in like a couple of hours, you know, wow. and I didn't even really have the chords totally worked out for the bridge, but it was like, okay. And so she, she pretty much had enough lyric, but if you noticed, 
there's no second verse. There's <laughs> <Just> like two <laughs> first verses. If you listen to the song, it's like, okay, well, then. but we, she got away with it. And on Thursday, we went in, it was either Thursday or Friday of that week, we went into AM Studios, just myself and her, me and her. And um, we laid it down, just acoustic. You know, I was playing the acoustic guitar and she was singing it. And uh, with no overdubs, anything. And that was it. That was the demo. We got it. I wish I had that demo. I don't know where that is. I oh, that would be awesome to hear. I don't know where. I don't, I don't know where that is. And um, and it got accepted into the movie. Wow. And I was like, wow, okay. And so then it was like, okay, now you got to produce it. You know, now you got to do it up a little bit. And since you know, since they had liked the acoustic version that we did, I figured I'd keep it kind of acoustic-y. Mm -hmm. And um, and being on AM Records, you know, they said, well. Why don't we have a guest artist to give it a little more star power? Because no one really knows Suzanne yet. It was after her first record. We maybe sold 90,000 records in the, on, on her first record in America, you know, um, which wasn't, was respectable. They, they didn't think she'd go past 15 or 20,000 records when they, they signed her and they thought that would be okay because it's the first record. So she was doing okay. And um, they said, well, you know, Joe Jackson's on our label. Maybe he can come in and play some piano on it. I went, hell yeah. Mm. You know, So all of a sudden, you know, I had a recording session. Then I had Joe Jackson coming down to lay in some piano on it. Wow. So this, was, this was, you know, for me, I mean, I, re I had really just produced Suzanne's first record. And so this was like a, a really fun opportunity. And of course, I was a little nervous working with Joe Jackson. But he was fine, and you know he did some beautiful piano work and a couple of souls at the end. And I remember him saying me, telling me, "Well, you know, you got to tell me if you, if this is good enough." And I go, "You know what? It's good enough. Thanks. <laughs> you know, it's fine." <laughs> he had a beautiful solo at the end. I didn't want to, mm. you know, keep going. Oh, well, try one more. Try one more. You know. And plus, we had we were on analog these those days. So we didn't have infinite tracks. And you know, so we submitted it. I, I did the mix. So we we mixed. I might have mixed it with somebody else at that point. And. Um, um, Harvey Goldberg, maybe. Yeah. And then, so we submitted the mix and the record company heard it and they thought maybe it was compared to the rest of the soundtrack, it was a little lightweight in terms of the production because I had gone for a little more acoustic thing. Mm. And they said, why don't you work with Arthur Baker and he'll put some, you know, a little more beef into it. I got fine. I, you know, I didn't care. It was my, you know, I had half the song. I was going to get it in the movie. So I got to work with Arthur Baker, who was very famous in those days for kind of the you know, really big snare sound and the drum beat and stuff. And, and so he added some production touches to it and he's very nice and didn't, you know, was very respectful of me. Mm -hmm. And then we got to mix it again uh, with him. And that's the version that's on the record, you know, and, um, so he cool. has not gone away for the, you know, 1986. It's now 37 years. It's iconic. It's so cool to have a song in that film. Yeah. And the, and the, the soundtrack went platinum, you know, and yeah. It, it, it paid off very nicely. So cool. Um, so now flash forward um, to, you know, today, you just right. produced the 16 Borders EP for Jim and Sasha Allen, yes. um, which is a history-making father-son duo on The Voice. Yeah, I didn't uh, realize the history-making part till you researched that a little more. I mean, I just... Uh, um, I, I thought they might have had some other trans artists there. This, you know, Sasha had trans trans in the middle of high school there. So, yeah. Well, they um, in the twenty one years of the show, Sasha was the first openly transgender artist to make it past the battlegrounds. Twenty one so, years to make it past the battle rounds. But so the I think show has been on for twenty one years. It's been on for twenty one years, apparently, Where? Steve. I. I I don't want to I think about it. I thought it was on it. for a couple of seasons. I, I, 20, <laughs> holy cow, have I been in a cave? I mean, I did look at this. I read this online, so maybe I should fact check it again. I'll write it in the show notes to make sure it is. Actually, yeah, sure. we have the internet right here. So let's, let's yeah, check take it a out. Look. Because, I mean, I, mean, I understand, you know, American Idol, but even you know, that was. Oh, God, Steve, it does say 21. 21 no, years. No, 21 seasons. Seasons. Well, still. There we go. Well, it's still, a, if they do two seasons a year. Okay, so. Still okay, so fact checking myself, um, it's actually 21 seasons and it started in 2011. So uh, that's, all right. Okay, I can yeah, see that. Yeah, I can yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah I can, that's yeah. acceptable. Okay. Stand, you stand corrected. I stand corrected. <laughs> so. See now, now if there was an internet back then, this band name Arbuckle would never have happened. 
I'm telling you that right now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> You would have had a different name, but yeah, I think you still yeah. would have had I the think, song. Yeah, probably, yeah, and the name didn't, I don't think the name helped us, or it might have hurt us, who knows. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the 16 Borders EP. It's four songs, and mm -hmm. it just got released, right? Yeah, just a few weeks ago, you know, it just came out, and um, it's another thing that just completely came out of the blue. Um, I you know, as as you go through this and you're a producer and you meet you meet A and R people along the way and you know, being in the business now for so long, a lot of those A and R people were very young when they started, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I met them and now they're in more powerful positions. And David Walter, who was originally I think an A and R rep at RCA, I don't know, fifteen, twenty years ago maybe, uh we had connected and done some stuff together over the years and he knew some of my younger engineers and he was always aware of me and uh, once in a while would send stuff. And when, when um, I guess it was Monty Lippman who runs head of Republic Records, part of UMG, hmm. decided they wanted to sign the, you know, sign Jim and Sasha Um it got dumped in David's lap. I was like, okay, you know, make a record with them. So David's, you know, and this is like a fairly acoustic duo in this day and age. So he's like, David was like, who the hell can do this? I go, Steve can do this. Yes. So I got, you know, I got the, thank God he remembered. And uh, so I got the call and I met them and, you know, it was really fun. And, and we basically did that thing in four days. You know, wow. we, we, we went through, you know, a few more of their songs and, uh, it was a real pleasure to work with them. They're both really talented. Um, Sasha, beautiful voice, and, and mm. Jim, who wrote writes the songs, multi instrumentalist, plays guitar, keyboards, mandolin, accordion, uh, you name it. Um, and I, I record. I wanted to record them pretty much live because I thought what they did was live. The harmonies they work off each other live. I didn't want to just go, okay, now, Jim, you do the basic track with guitar and your vocal, and then we'll add Sasha. I just didn't think it would work that way. So I mm -hmm. set them up, you know, in, in my room, separated them enough in case, you know, we do want to fix a line here or there, I'll be able to. And we pretty much recorded the whole thing live. I mean, the first day we spent um, going through different songs, just trying to see, you know, which ones might be the better ones to record. And because we were, we, they told us we could record four songs for an EP. And so we pretty much spent the first day getting acquainted and getting mm -hmm. um, getting the sound together, um, learning what they can do, what they can't do. Um, Sasha didn't want to play guitar at all. He wanted his dad to do it. So, you know, the first day we kind of did that. The second day we actually started, you know, going for takes and we picked the four songs. We might have done a couple of songs each day and then uh, I added... I added some bass on it and uh, electric guitar on 16 borders. And then Jim did some external, uh, some other overdubs on keyboards and, uh, you know, did some rough mixes on Friday and sent it off and everyone loved it. And I finished up the mixes soon after that. And that was pretty much it. Maybe five days, you know, we were done with that. Wow. And, uh, you know, I was really happy with it. They were really happy with it. You know, I think, I think... I've done a lot of first albums in my career, you know, mm -hmm. so I have, I have a, a big, a good bedside manner for it, I guess. And, uh, plus they were very talented. It was just a joy to work with. And to, the key to me was their harmonies because that's uh -huh. something that's priceless. Cause you don't get a, I mean, when was the last time there was a father son duo came out anywhere. I, I don't can't know. think of get, get your research team on it and see, cause I, I right? don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't really, can't think of one. So it's like, well, this is kind of unique, you know, and it a little bit harkens back to the Everly Brothers, a little bit sometimes it's Simon and Garfunkel, you know, it's a little bit the t two male voices, but um, um, I didn't want to imitate anything. I just wanted to figure out what was right for their songs and, and not really change them too much, but just kind of raise the bar a little bit for them. And I, you know, I think it, I think it came out beautiful and and also, I, I didn't want to add a lot of stuff to this one. You know, hopefully this will be successful enough and we can go back in and maybe we get a real drummer next time. I don't know. You know, we, 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 we up the ante a little bit. Um, but uh, it was it was really, you know, out of nowhere, you know, so all of a sudden, you know, not having anything out on a major label for years. Uh, it was another one of those things like, well, I guess if you stick around long enough and you've done some good work in the past, maybe, you know. 
the world takes care of you a little bit. Yes, I believe that. <laughs> I believe that, Steve. For sure. uh, that is wonderful. Uh, so I got to ask, what's next for you? I know you're going on tour with Eric Anderson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, if I knew the answer to that question, I probably would be doing something else. But, you know, what's next? I never quite know what's next. I'm, I'm, um, I'm still involved with the uh, with Sony uh, re remixing or or mixing for the first time. Bob Dylan outtakes. We have a new one coming out in January. The Time Out of Mind album. Uh, wow. I worked on a one CD worth of. Uh, unreleased stuff from that, you know, alternate takes that were really quite good. Daniel Lanois mm. produced it originally and recorded it. So it's a really well, well recorded, um, well recorded album. Um, uh, I work, I do a lot of work for the archives too. Uh, we're issuing some Leonard Cohen concerts from 1972, more for copyright purposes, but after 50 years, they have to renew the copyright. So they, they release them somewhere in Europe for two weeks and then, they, they retain the copyright so no one can use these performances for anything else without going through Sony. So it's just something record oh. companies have to do, you know, for their business. Um, so, you know, we've been doing that, going through those, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of work right there. Um, you know, we just finished this 42-song uh, tribute record to Eric Anderson, which is all of Eric's songs, performed by friends of his, acquaintance of his, people who love his music. And so it's 42 different productions of different songs of his that is slated to come out. I think it's uh, next week, maybe October 19th, I think is the official date. Oh, and, uh, it's perfect a, timing. It's, yeah, it's a triple CD, believe it or not. And plus, you know, being up, up online and stuff. And But we have some, we have, track by Janice Ian. We have an unreleased track by Bob Dylan. We wow. have um, um, one of your locals, Eric Bazilian, did a track. Beautiful. Came out great, you know. Um, yeah, I should have the list in front of me, but there's so many people like Dan Navarro, Lucy Kaplansky, Cliff Eberhardt, um, a lot of, uh, a lot, Larry Campbell Ted, ter, and, and Teresa. Um there's so many I can't even remember them all but um, there's some really some people did some amazing stuff on this so it's really and it's a very eclectic record Sid Straw's on it Lenny K did a track I mean wow. all, all different all different types uh, of versions of his song so that that's been going on for about a year and a half I mean that's a big project and I had to put it all together you know putting 42 songs from different producers and different mixes and people did it on garage band and people did it in big studios and oh, trying wow. to make it sound it was it was a lot of work so that's that's that you know um for myself you know the the person i get to last you know, <laughs> the per you know, who i ne never seem to have enough time to book myself uh and i'm hoping to do at least a few more you know, maybe an EP. I don't know if I have it in me to do another whole album yet, but you know, I've got, I've got a couple, I've got about four or five songs kicking around that, you know, I should just, you know, maybe I'll just get not busy for a while and just go, okay, now is the time to do it, you know, and, and just kind of get in there and just show up and get in the creative zone and get these things done. Yeah. I mean, why not just take a few weeks for you? Maybe over the <laughs> holiday or something. Uh, yeah. Well, seems easy, doesn't it? It seems like a very simple concept. It, it, it does. <laughs> but when you're busy, it, it gets very like complicated. It seems like a simple concept. And then there's this, <laughs> this studio that wants, you know, they they keep telling me to pay an electric bill. I mean, okay, yeah, no, so we got to keep it running. But um, I've got one track on the Eric Anderson track, which I can use as a starter. And it came out beautiful, you know, it really oh, did. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what's going on right now. You know, it's more than I thought because I think in the summer it seemed like, well, I mean, I was working on the Eric record. It's, a lot of stuff was going on, but it didn't seem, you know, not until the end. The Sasha and Jim thing we did back in February. Oh, you know? so okay. you know, once you're on a major label, these things take time, you know, and finally they they get it together and they release it, you know, on their release schedule. So there's these big gaps, and like you do all the stuff, and then you just sit and wait. Are they going to put it out? Are they going to put it out? And so they did. So, the anticipation. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, well, Steve, 
It has been a pleasure. And there's so much more we can talk about. I feel like we're going to have to do like a part two eventually yeah. because you just if I live so long much. enough, yeah, we'll do a part two. Oh <laughs> so much stuff. Yeah, it's like a long time. No, we have some... a lot of lot of lot of stories in between all those that we mentioned, you know. And um, but you know, I still get excited by doing this. It's still exciting to 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 work on stuff. You know, I'm also helping uh, my friend Mark Berga, who had this album Ride. Who he writes songs kind of about the great great west you know out there and uh i've been playing with him live and he's uh and he's trying to get some songs in a movie and stuff so we're just i'm helping him mix his record now too and that's an interesting process so there's so there's all these little projects that are scattered around you know so you keep busy for I sure keep, i keep busy you know so it's like me i kind You're of demand me? i can book me so yeah so yeah i'm i'm, I'm not going to complain about that that's for sure you're in demand, Steve. Demand. That's a beautiful thing. Right. And we have to write some more songs because we wrote some cool pop songs. Oh, my gosh. That is happening. Okay, good. So, good. yeah, good. I've, I have a few pieces. I'm like, oh, these, you know, this hook would be good to write with Steve to finish mm -hmm. um, flushing it out. Yeah. And cool. you always make my vocals sound so good, Steve. Ah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the warmth. Like, you bring out the warmth in vocals. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, you, you, want, you want people to listen to them you know you don't want them to be edgy and nasty because then you turn the volume down you want people to turn the volume up yeah yeah it, i think the vocal is the hardest of course to record i mean it's, I don't know so if it's the hardest to record but i think it's the hardest it's certainly the hardest to perform and i think it's the hardest to present because it's 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 90 percent of any record let's face it you know mm. so because if it's not you know, the rest of it's it all you know, sugar and candy is sort of, but you know, the vocal still has to <clears throat> really speak. For more on Steve, visit steveadabo.com. And for more information on Shelter Island Sound, visit shelterislandsound.com. And thank you so much for tuning in and growing in creativity with us. I'd love to know what you thought of today's episode, what you found most interesting, what you found most helpful, you can reach out to me on social media at Jennifer Logue or leave a review for Creative Space on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover it. I appreciate you so much for being here in the beginning stages of this. My name is Jennifer Logue, and thanks for listening to this episode of Creative Space, which I do export using MP3. So thank you, Steve, Suzanne, and Dr. Brandenburg. Until next time. Steve, visit steveadabo.com. And for more information on Shelter Island Sound, visit shelterislandsound.com. And thank you so much for tuning in and growing in creativity with us. I'd love to know what you thought of today's episode, what you found most interesting, what you found most helpful. You can reach out to me on social media at Jennifer Logue or leave a review for Creative Space on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover it. I appreciate you so much for being here in the beginning stages of this. My name is Jennifer Logue, and thanks for listening to this episode of Creative Space, which I do export using MP3. So thank you, Steve, Suzanne, and Dr. Brandenburg. Until next time.